There's actually an interview between Block and Adorno that's really interesting. It's um, called um, Something's Missing. Oh, yeah. And they're both trying to be polite and seem <laughs> as if they agree on more than they do. And the person in the interview seems to be trying to figure out, so what is the difference between you? And so eventually the difference does come out. Adorno is deeply committed to what utopia all it is is you know, a negative affirmation that you know there's some incompleteness in our life. It cannot say positively what that life would look like if it were fulfilled. In fact, you know, Adorno is very resistant. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'm thinking about you know, the, the, the ban on, on images. Grave and images. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Block does not have that problem. Um, you know, even near the end of the principle of hope, he is very confident saying it's a place uh, without deprivation. It's a place where, you know, um, obviously he means this more metaphorically, where humanity walks upright. He is also very committed, and this is, you know, a little bit outside the principle of hope, but he thinks he's willing to name it as communism. That, you know, he thinks that, you know, mm -hmm. we can actually cognize and we have some sort of presentiment of what that social order would have to be in which, you know, humanity would actually find itself um, at the end of prehistory or as he uses near the end of the principle of hope, an actual genesis for humanity. And so... For Adorno, who's far more tentative, where utopia is supposed to be this space of interruption, this place of where you know thinking lets the object be, in, in, in a sense, you know, not to be mm -hmm. you know too reductive, Bloch is fully willing to say what this fulfillment is, and he is even willing to say its potential it already inheres in the subject's daydreams and desires. And for Adorno, he'd be like. Those things that are expression of the culture industry, those dangerous passions, you're trying to, you know, rescue some aspect of that. And so that's where I think they depart, that, you mm. know, there's actually more of a militancy, a sort of self-confidence in Ernst Bloch's thinking of utopia, rather than, you know, Adorno's, you know, kind of uh, focus on interruption and, you know, not dominating the concept. For Bloch, the concept must embrace totally this vision of what social life would look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Adorno's project is, I don't know if it makes sense to frame it this way, but it just always strikes me as more critical than what the kind of project that Bloch is doing. I mean, the idea that, you know, the, the wrong life cannot be lived rightly and all of the forces at both a conceptual, historical, like economic level, which make this life the wrong life, I feel, Adorno makes you feel the weight of all of that pressing down on our attempts to think, our attempts to do otherwise are like, it's the weight of the administered world that I always feel. Maybe this is just the way I read Adorno, but I just, you always mm -hmm. feel it in an almost kind of suffocating way. And at least just at, at the level of philosophical ethos, like what Bloch strikes me as doing, even though I think they are really close conceptually on a lot of fronts, at the level of like philosophical ethos, what he's doing just strikes me as so much more orientated toward windows out of that suffocating Mm. like administered world that Adorno so into describing. Yeah. I guess then like the practical difference might end up being like, an, like Adorno might say in response to this, that like, yeah, like you put it sort of funnily and polemically, like, isn't that just the culture industry again? Right. But like the, the worry <laughs> would be that like when we start allowing ourselves to make positive claims about what the nature of like a utopian uh, concrete utopia would look like, how, how do we, what guarantees do we have that we're not being duped by Call it what you will, you know, dominant mm, instrumental rational, rationality, yeah, capitalist ideology, um, you know, bourgeois thinking, identity thinking, and so on. I think Adorno's concern about the ban on graven images here isn't like, let's be charitable, isn't to say that like we could never like imagine that things could be better, but like, are you sure that you're not still a dupe in some way? And I think that that's, mm -hmm. the, that's the worry, at least. Although I think you're right that like they're so close. I, I will say that when I read Adorno, I do feel that longing, like the kind of yearning for a better, like redeemed world, the kind of thing that Bloch talks about. I just don't think it's, I, I just don't think it's as thematized as, as the way Bloch treats it. Like it's front and center. This is a part of human cognition. It's not like, this is a part of the way we relate to the world, just as a fact about yeah. like human social life. We relate in the mode of yearning and imagining, wanting things to be otherwise, wanting things to be better. And like his claim, I think, is that philosophers just haven't really paid attention to this critical facet of human cognition and human desire. 
And yeah, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it is. I don't know. I don't want to deflate it so much to say it's like a difference of emphasis or something, but because you can see when Adorno says like, you know, what is, is more than it is like, that's what Block wants to say. That's what Block is saying about realism. What I said at the beginning about Mm -hmm. how realism and utopia are not, are not uh, antithetical. That Adorno line for me, like captures that overcoming of that opposition between realism and utopia. Like what is, is more than it is. And it's about excavating and recovering disseminating, enhancing those potentialities within what does exist and what has existed rather than like inventing nice places in the future. So, you know, like, yeah. So to respond to like, you know, Gil's question and yeah, this is the thing that people plug Ernst Block on. Are you sure? Even though he keeps saying there are obviously, you know, hopes that are reactionary. There are hopes that are, are conservative that further integrate how things are. And he wants to be able to analyze and catalyze, you know, the hopes that he thinks are, you know, explosive that will bring us, you know, um, out of ourselves. I think here is where, um, you know, it's important not to forget that Block thinks that there is a very, um, there is very much an important place for social science. So that's what is the point mm. of the quote that I, I read at the very end of my remarks, where he's like saying, you know, even if hope is only what you know, expands our horizons, but you know, critical knowledge is what allows our, our social practice to be coherent. For Block, he calls this the cold stream of Marxism. Oh yeah, the Marxism. But a gr- that, a fantastic you know, distinction, by the way. I yeah, I really like it, and I, I really like that language of the cold stream and the warm stream, where yeah. You know, Block is you know trying to say I don't think the warm stream does it all. The cold stream is what actually sets us you know sets mm-hmm. before us what the material conditions of the world are, how it works, how it functions, its relations. But he doesn't think the cold stream actually gets you to understanding how subjects become engaged in that social practice. And, Maybe you, you should know, just say really quickly what, how he defines the cold and warm stream. The cold stream. Think of the cold stream as you know um, the really sort of technical Marxism that wants to understand say the actual grounding of concepts like surplus value, um, exploitation, what actually is capital, you know, mm-hmm. how do we define it? I actually, in some ways, I think like a lot of Lillian's work is, you know, reading and dealing with the cold stream of Marxism. Mm-hmm. But for um, Bloch, the warm stream is, you know, um, the vibrancy of our, um, our cognition, our desires, the actual subjective impulse to engage with the world as something that could be different. And he mm-hmm. is trying to understand how can we bring the cold stream, the warm stream together in a, a, a dialectical unity that we understand that people aren't simply moved by facts. They are yeah. moved by what draws them forward. And for him, I'll just say this last thing because I think it's really important. He also has an analysis of the danger of leaving hope out of the account because he thinks hope, when it curdles, you get people who will be drawn in by reactionary political formations. You get apathy. You get the sense that people won't even be able to understand why they're a part of a movement for changing things. And his, part of his understanding of the rise of Nazism is that the Nazis spoke a very vicious and dangerous language of hope returning to the homeland, returning to what has been taken from you, rather than you know, a type of forward surging. So I, I hope that makes sense you know, rather mm-hmm. quickly, you know, how Block erects his own guardrails on how to try to figure out which hopes are significant, which hopes are perhaps conservative or reactionary. Mm. I mean, one is like certainly based on nostalgia, right? Mm-hmm. As, yes. I mean, I, I think that sounds like one way of putting it that like the reactionary kind of hope tends to think about the past in a, in a way that, I don't know, I guess I have, I had a bigger th- thought, but I think that there are different ways of having nostalgia. So I think you could say it's all, it's all bad, but I'm not sure I want to commit to that. But there is so, but I think there certainly is like a reactionary kind of nostalgia that seems very distinctively is belonging to the political right. That is hundred um, percent. A kind mm-hmm. of hope. Yeah, but this, yeah, that's that's right. And maybe like Bloch's concepts can help us like explain what that difference is, right? Because like the the form of like nostalgic hope that we get in reactionary and fascistic discourse and movement is precisely not holding out that that thing that that Bloch is so interested in. That like the not yet doesn't have the same status, the same being as like what already has been. 
So, you know, the return fascists, you know, in a way they're like, you know, you have something to hope for, but what you have to hope for is what's already been. You don't have anything to hope for that that could be actually different or actually be otherwise. So like, you know, they're they're only retrospective even in their like they seem like they're futurally oriented, but they can't be. They're just not interested in making real, making realized, you know, the the tendencies of that that have that have come before us but which like haven't been actualized yet, like, you know, you said walking on two feet for the first time in history would be pretty cool, but that's not what the fascists ever promise. <laughs> they promise you that you'll be able to beat other people like dogs. And that's, we've seen enough of that. That's been, you know, we got a long, long past to that already, I would think. And also to respond to the nostalgia question. So this is why, um, you know, again, to make the case for why I wanted to read Godmer and Block together. An interesting point of conversion is, it's not that Block thinks history is bad, or else why does he keep talking about like Joachim of Fiori and yeah. you know, going back? Mark, he even yeah. makes the claim that you know people are like, yeah, Marx is the, the thinker of the 19th century. We're done with that. It, but it, I think Block does have a type of nostalgia, but he doesn't have a nostalgia for what has already occurred. He has a nostalgia for what didn't get its chance in the sun yet. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. the the hermeneutics of hope is to be a a particular type of disposition that can return to our history and excavate what did not get its chance, what can inspire us, what can give us a language to describe what can you know, what can carry forward, and to not simply see history as written by the powerful, the victorious, the what he calls the common sense, as opposed to the bon sens, the good sense. And so the, my my like full throated case for this idea is like even how do we establish the horizons of intelligibility to be able to look at our own traditions and, and past and recover resources that didn't get their chance to be fully fleshed out to give us a sense of what type of world you know we could build from the ruins of this world. Because it's simply not enough simply just to gesture at castles in the air. He wants to say that there is knowledge to excavate from what has gone before and to mobilize once again. I'd like to know more about like the, the controversy surrounding Ernst Bloch. So like I, I haven't really thought about it very deeply, but when you're saying that people dunk on him, like I, I recognize that as a, a pattern without having pursued an answer to like why. And, and I, and I think that like in a way this is like very amenable to my way of thinking about things. Like I like thinking about, path dependency is like something that he talks talks about a lot trying to think about the the not yet and it's a it's a kind of like mode of like imminent critique that feels like that it just doesn't feel like somebody I want to dunk on it it feels normal so um <laughs> I'd like to know more why like what is everybody's problem with this, because um, I feel like that would help me just situate what the beef about utopia isn't in general. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. and also like kind of what motivates Will your your project. I do know that there's all these discussions about utopia in which people are really hostile to it or think it's childish, but like the way in which I think about that tends to be more just explicitly along the lines of like the communist manifesto. Like, and I just read that and I'm like, yep, there are different kinds of socialisms and some are not, you know, are utopian in a way that makes political, like actual social transformation very difficult. And I take that to be like Marx and Engels corrective. Like that's the corrective of the Marxist tradition. So like yeah. what goes on in the late 20th century where all the philosophers started just making utopia a baddie. If mm. I'm, so, I'm sorry if that's too basic yeah. of a question, but I, I no, not at all. I'm genuinely yeah, that's a good historical curious. question. Yeah, I have two answers. What I think went on. One, I'm going to go with I think why why liberals or people who are liberally inclined dunk on block. Mm -hmm. I think he was really tarred by his association with East Germany and you know, the eventual <laughs> eventual of revelations of Stalin. This is so insane. <laughs> no, I, I really think <laughs> yeah. it's that. Like, no, I think know, it's true, but it, that's it, just, yeah. And, and I think, you know, and on the more sort of Adornian critical theory side, and obviously I want to be gentler with that side, but I think part of the problem is, you know, 
Block actually linked up with actual political institutions to try to do this. He did not feel like he needed to kind of um, conserve his innocence. You know, he did not think he needed to try to conserve his intellectual dependence and use theory to uh, eventually make the way for a type of undistorted social practice. He actually risked himself and he paid the price. You know, he did. He eventually found out, you know, he bet wrong, you know, in some of his writings while he was in East Germany. And you know he had to he had to leave, but I think you know on the more adorning critical theory side, he was too activist. You know mm-hmm. he was you know, he was too sure um, mm-hmm. that you know this movement was was underway. The response I have to that is. I don't read Bloch as absolutely sure that communism will come about. He says, you know, things even what you read where he's like, like, no, there's always the possibility of disappointment. None of this is, you know, a guarantee or else why would we have hope? We would just have confidence. It wouldn't be hope, yeah. There'd be no contingent part of it. You wouldn't have hope. But those are my my two responses to your historical question. Mm -hmm. I think, one, he was tarred by, you know, actually being closely associated with communism and two he really did try to participate in this sort of active production of a new social way of thinking that even sort of left critical theories were like, you know, why didn't you see that it wasn't going to work out? Dude, this is so crazy. I feel like the more I think about this, the more insane the Frankfurt School gets. Like <laughs> this um, situation <laughs> where like you have the, the people living in like the Soviet bloc, like obviously, you know, they're like the kind of anti-communism of it all. And then you kind of find philosophical justifications for that. And then like on the other side, the anti-positivist stuff were like, well, you know, likewise, like some of those guys were really a part of like projects to like, Mm -hmm. you know, and and we're really optimistic about the capacity, you know, like we talked about before, like Mm -hmm. the capacity of human reason to make things better, you know? And like, Mm -hmm. so I'm just seeing like in two different polls, like you have in the West, this kind of like argument against pos- like positivism and like this favoring of this negative mode of critique. And then I, if Bloch is a re- representative of like people trying to work with, with and against the kind of the structure of the, the Eastern Bloch, then like, I, like what is the Frankfurt School doing? Like I, I just, what, <laughs> like why did it become like the one true Apostle, and I'm not saying this to be like yeah. polemical. No, I um, yeah. actually like I know that I have like a soft spot for like I grant it, like I do have more of like the cold stream in me, but like I also just don't get what happened there. Like, why did they like inherit this tradition and then like the more creative side to things or like the the hopeful? I, I don't know. Do you guys understand my question? Like, how did this yes. happen? Yeah. yeah. I feel like I can, maybe part of the answer lies in, um, and not just with the Frankfurt School, but with Utopia falling out of favor in like late mm-hmm. 20th century, is that there is a humanism that Bloch is like unapologetically advancing. Yeah, yeah he is. And, there's no way and I think that, yeah. there's no way, and and like that humanism very much fell out of fashion in many circles, right? Frankfurt School, like pro structuralist, like Althusserian Marx, structuralist Marxist, like that. And I think that utopia gets inherently connected. It gets inherently connected to that humanism. But I just want to say, Bloch is not like a naive humanist. Like he gives a pretty good in that conclusion. I'm not generally like you know reflexively sympathetic toward like humanist account, humanist Marxism. We know. <laughs> but he gives, <laughs> <laughs> Humans, being, I remember Owen being like, being human doesn't get you shit in this shit. world. It doesn't get you anything. Yeah, it doesn't get that's you. his point. But I think he actually advances an argument for humanism as a normative standard, a non-distorted human life that is not like exploited, dominated, and twisted. And I think he gives a decent defense of it and also shows that this is not some feature of like the early Marx, like everybody likes to say it is. He finds yeah, in Capital yeah, Volume yeah. 3 and all throughout Capital, like places where that are actually, I found pretty damn convincing of like why it is that what the, the kind of concrete materialist humanism he takes himself to be developing is actually very well grounded in Marxian political economy, not just in the like early, like young mm-hmm. Marx. The goofy shit when he'd been the reading too much shit. Feuerbach yeah, yeah. and yeah. didn't know himself <laughs> yet or whatever. And like, and there, is some times where, weed. <laughs> and there is some times where I want to pretty critically step back and almost enter the kind of warm stream that he describes and just be like, well, yeah, oh, like, why do we have so many, maybe that we get a little bit too cute about this kind of stuff. Like, obviously we have certain humanistic, yearn, there's a certain kind of humanistic <laughs> yearning 
that animates why it is that we talk about or do any of this stuff. Like we want to not suffer like this. We want to live in a, a good world where our basic aspects of our humanity are honored and taken care of. Like, I don't know. I, I just uh, so. No, not me, man. I just want the cultural <laughs> cachet of being edgy. But, <laughs> like you know, just, I'm built a little yeah. bit different. Hey, thanks so much for listening. That was just a small sample of the full episode. To listen to it and to access other premium content we're putting out, including all of our series-specific episodes, please subscribe to us on Patreon at patreon.com slash philosophy. See you next time.